sisters that our visit to you was not without result. We have been previously suffered, been treated outrighteously in Philippi. As you know, but we will help, but with the help of our God, we dare to tell you his gospel in the face of opposition. Yes. Even though you've been beaten down and broken by life, God still wants you to tell others about him and to worship him because what may be your adversary today will be your testimony tomorrow. Amen. And if he lives to t and think about the lives he will touch through you. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for bringing us to your church today. Allow the musicians to be able to lead your spirit into service, God. Allow everyone to be able to worship and to be able to feel what you think, what, what you want for them, God. And allow us to go out into the world and be able to share your message, God. And allow us to touch the lives in ours, God. Thank you. Amen. Stand with us. Welcome to Remedy. Let's give God some praise in the house this morning. Amen.
God some praise? Yeah. 
says, for we are God's masterpiece. We are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things that God planned for us a long ago. And then I remember a verse in Jeremiah says, I know the plans that I have for you, Megan. They are plans to bless you. They are plans to prosper you and for good and not to destroy, to give you a hope and a future. I don't know what you came in here with. I don't know what sickness or what bondage or what oppressive spirit has tried to come up in here. But this is the house of the Lord. Lord of our shot. And it's not welcome in this house. Your ability to worship the Father is to understand that if God started something, He's going to finish. He is. He's on the throne. And nothing catches Him off guard. There's not a sickness. There's not a layoff. There's not a disease. There's not an attitude that caught God off guard. If it's in front of you, then God has already given you the ability to walk right through. To walk right through. My Jesus, so when we say, God, you are good. You are good all the time. Even when I'm going through stuff. Somebody say stuff. This type of stuff is doing nothing but to transfer you from one level of glory to the other. The problem that we have, church, is we stay right here in the stuff instead of rising above it and lifting up the name of Jesus and just worshiping. When you worship, it puts the devil on the run. It makes all of hell begin to triple and all of heaven begins to come down. I don't know what you came to do. I don't even know what you came up in this house for. But if we can take the next 15 seconds and just begin to focus on Jesus and lose our mind for God already working it out, for already blessing. If you ain't got nothing to bless him, if your name's in the Lamb's book of life, that's enough. Somebody in this house, begin to go to God and worship him. Father, you are good. Even in our own perception, Lord God, when we don't see things working out, God, we know that you go before us. And if the word of God declares that we are a masterpiece and that you have plans to prosper us, then whatever it is that we're going through, Lord, you've already taken care of. So may our eyes be taken off of that and put on the king of all kings. You are the Lord of my life, and I love you dearly, Lord Jesus. I'm looking for you, God, this morning to pour out glory over your children this morning, God. Wreck this house, God, with glory, God, as we lift up the name of Jesus.
worship. Nobody else can worship for you. If you want to worship God, you have to do it. Nobody's forcing you to, and your worship may look different than mine. That's okay. God knows your heart. Amen.
told Moses, build a tabernacle. A tabernacle. Now in the Old Testament, you've got to understand something. You and I, we, we don't understand the value of the presence of God anymore. We don't understand the worth of the presence of God anymore. Why? Because we can come to God at any time. But I think that the Lord is speaking to me this morning and I need to communicate to you today that it wasn't always like this. In the Old Testament, there were only certain people that got to go certain levels and certain places that God would allow them to go. You and I were not even allowed to step foot inside. We had no communication. There was no way that we could get to where He was. Inside this tabernacle, there was the outer court. And then there was the inner court. And then there was the, the holy place. And behind a veil was what was called the most holy place. You see, that even people who could get inside the tabernacle to the outer, outer courts and even into the inner courts and even into the holy place, there, there, were, there was only one person that could go into the Holy of Holies or the most holy place. Why? Because that's where the presence of God was. Now I need you to understand something, and this is where the value comes in. It's that those high priests, the things that they wore, allowed them to walk in, and when they got into the presence of God, they would wear bells on the bottom of their robes, and they would wear a rope attached to their ankle, and when they walked in, you would know if they were worthy of standing in the presence of God or not because they would hear the bells ring and the high priest, had he had any sin in his life, would fall dead in the presence of God. And he had the rope around his ankle because they had to drag him out because for fear of not going into where the presence of God was. He's a holy God. There was one person in all of that time that could enter into the most holy place. But I'm thankful. Because it all changed 2,000 years ago. In the physical, holy of holies, in the physical, the room where His presence was, He has now made a dwelling place to receive. 
We've got some saints of God in the house and you understand that your freedom is only two feet away from your, your hip to the tip of your finger. You're, you you understand that there's some people in the house today you need to understand today that your freedom is only two feet away in surrender I, I don't want you to think that because you lift your hand God is free but what I want you to know is the symbol what this represents you lifting your hand says God I surrender to you that means my life is surrendered to you my words are surrendered to you my actions are surrendered to you my patterns of living are surrendered to you my job is surrendered to you I may not be in a job right now that I need to be in, but I will surrender, God, if you'll give me another one. I might not be in the place that I need to be in right now, but God, I'll surrender to you if you'll do something in me that changes something.
so much for being here this morning. Joining us for worship. So glad to have you worshiping with us in the house of God today. Thank you for being here on Memorial Day weekend. There's a lot of people that get this day confused with Veterans Day, but this is not Veterans Day. Today is the day that we honor those who fell in their service to our country. Today is the day that we honor those that gave everything so that we could have all that we have today. I have several people who are veterans in my family. I'm thankful that they made it home from the wars that they fought and the places they, they went. But my heart breaks this morning for families and people who have had spouses and husbands and fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters who have gone away and never got to come home. And I know that this is a very solemn thing and I know that this is a very um, reverent sort of thing. But we wouldn't have what we have unless they gave everything that they had. And this morning, rather than being mournful because weeping may endure for a night joy comes in the morning can we just give a rap, big huge round of applause and appreciation for those that gave their lives for us in service to this country so thankful for those who serve um, and continue to serve and listen uh, I don't bring a lot of I don't bring any political things in here but this is not a political thing this is giving honor where honor is due and I want you to understand and know that, that we have the freedoms we have but it wasn't free right it, there was a price that was paid and I'm thankful this morning that I get double citizenship that I'm a citizen of America, but I am also a citizen of the kingdom of God. And get this, you'll like this. He didn't need an army. All he needed was one person. And he went and he did that thing. And now I'm free. Free indeed. Because the Son set me free. It was because of Him that I stand free in that citizenship this morning. Nobody else did it. Nobody else could do it but Jesus. And I'm thankful this morning that my citizenship here and in heaven is active and it's alive today because of Him. He gave it all. And so today, I, we just want to honor those who have given their, um, their lives in service. And we say thank you so much to all of the families. If you're watching via live stream, we thank you so much for your service and your family's service. Uh, for, for this country. If we could have our ushers come forward this morning, we're going to continue on in our worship service with our giving. It's a very important time of our service. This is a moment of stewardship. God expects us to be good stewards. Good stewards of our time, good stewards of our energy, good stewards of our money. He's blessed us with everything that we have. That citizenship that I just talked about the things that we have and partake in and participate in in the kingdom happen because we are good stewards. Part of good stewardship in the kingdom of God is giving of our tithe and of our offering. Tithe and offering are two different things. The tithe is His. Is this alright? Can I tell you a little bit about giving? Because I just I don't want to assume that everybody knows what I'm talking about. Tithe, the word tithe literally means a tenth. So we give tithe based on a biblical principle and a practice that we see all the way back to Abraham who gave a tithe to Melchizedek. Okay? And it traveled all, all the way through. And if you don't think that Jesus talked about tithe, He did. We'll talk about it another time. But tithe, it belongs to God. He said in Malachi 3, bring the tithe into my house so that my house might be full. 
Not just, not just full with people, but full so that the ministry can go forward. So we can do things for people. So that we can bless people as He wants them to be blessed. So that my house is taken care of. The tithe is His. And then there's offering. Offering is a giving above and beyond that tithe. Now this is for just the really generous people. So if you ain't generous, you can just turn your, turn, turn your, turn your uh, listening ears off. Okay? But the tithe, tithe is God's. Offering is above and beyond that. God loves a generous heart. He loves a person that looks at His kingdom and says, I could never give enough because of what Christ has done for me. All that He has given me, I want to give back. And I want to see the kingdom of God move forward. You see, your mind has to change when it comes to giving. We're cool coming in the house and worshiping and lifting our hands and singing our songs and hearing the preacher, but, but when I go to give something, your mindset has to change. From... It's a, my faith is about me and this thing is about me to this is about the kingdom. This is about brothers and sisters that don't know their brothers and sisters yet. This is about the church of Jesus Christ. Not, the, not Remedy Church, but the church of Jesus Christ going out into the highways, the byways, and the hedges and all of the things that we do. Amen. So let's prepare our hearts to give of our tithe and of our offering. If you're new here today, if it's your first time or maybe it's your second, third, seventh, I don't know. But you haven't filled out a prayer card and you'd like to connect with us and you just believe that maybe writing down my prayer request today would change something. I'm telling you, I believe in the power of prayer. And I've shared stories the last couple of weeks. I'd love to continue to share those stories. Um, if you have a story, I'd love to hear about it. Because prayer works. And if you've got a prayer request, and you're inside your bulletin, you'll see a flap that you can fold out. It's called a prayer card. Just fill that out. Slip it into the offering bag on its way by. We'll connect with you and pray with you. And ask the Lord to touch you. Are you ready to give this morning? Let's prepare our hearts. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for all of those who gave their lives in service to this country. Father, for us to have the freedom to come and worship in a house of worship, in a designated place to say that you are king and to declare it for the communities that we live in. God, we thank you for those. And Father, we thank you this morning that you have given us everything that you have given us. God, that you've entrusted to us all that we have. Today, during this time, God, we just give back to you. We understand that we can never outgive you. We can never match or measure up to what you've given. But God, you don't ask that of us. God, you just ask us to be generous and cheerful as we give. And Father, today, whatever we give, Lord, I pray blessing and favor would come into lives of those who give, Father, in any facet. God, we thank you, Jesus, for all that you're going to do using this time and this giving, Lord, to build up your kingdom here on the earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you as you give this morning. Well, welcome to Remedy. We're happy you've chosen to worship with us today. If you're new to Remedy, we'd like to welcome you to our church. There is a prayer card in the back of your bulletin. We'd like to partner with you in praying for any requests you'd like to share with us. Please fill out the prayer card and place it in the offering bag. Or you can take it to the Connect Center at the end of service to receive a free Remedy t-shirt. If you're a volunteer in any department, please plan to join us for our Serve Team kickoff on June 2nd, right after morning service pizza will be provided. Please join us for prayer every Thursday starting at 6.30. Camp meeting is June 23rd through the 26th at Landmark Church of God in Statesville. To sign up for these or other events, you can visit remedychurchnc.org slash calendar. Click on the event to register or sign up in the Connect Center. Remedy Kids are now dismissed. backseat arguing and fighting. I'm still thankful for them though. <laughs> I told somebody the other day, parenting is like the, the worst, best thing that could ever happen to you. It messes with your mind, man. I'm telling you. It just messes with you. 
Yes, volunteer meeting next Sunday. Uh, if you are currently volunteering in any way, shape, or form, we want you to plan to stay after service next Sunday. We are going to kick off what we're calling the serve team. If you uh, serve in any way, any format, if you're a teacher, if you're a leader of any kind, or if you're just a uh, person who uh, serves in a rotation, you, you're not necessarily uh, a leader, but you do serve, uh, we want you to plan to stay. And we're going to feed you, and we're going to feed you pizza. I don't know if you like pizza, but I do. And uh, this is a good opportunity as well. If you're not currently serving, we'd love for you to be at this meeting if you do want to serve. But you'd say, I really don't know where it is that I should plug into. This is a good opportunity for you to come and uh, participate in this meeting and kind of get the, get the information you need to begin serving. We've got your Bibles this morning. John chapter 15. It's going to be verses 12 through 13. I'm reading from the New Living Translation this morning. Uh, I, do, I do want to say, uh, I don't want to just gloss over the honoring of those who served. It's so important for us to understand that. To understand what it means to lay your life down for something, for a cause. Many of us go through our lives and we never find a cause to lay our life down for it. Pastor, I'm a Christian. I would lay my life down for Jesus. You're not under that situation right now. Right? The hope is that all of us would be able to say that at any moment, in any situation, any circumstance, I would be willing to give this life up that I'm living for the cause of Christ. There are those who served and gave their life, gave everything that they had. They gave up everything to serve you and I so that we can have what we have in this country today. I'm thankful for that. I don't want to just gloss over that, but today I'm here to celebrate Jesus most of all. And in John chapter 15, verses 12 through 13, it says, Jesus says, This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. Verse 13 says this, There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. This is why the laying down of a life is so important. It's because there are men and women who served in our armed forces and our military that have gone to countries that we have not known. And they haven't known me and they haven't known you, but for your good and for your freedom, they fall and they die. And this is modeled in the gospel that we see of Jesus. Jesus, we don't physic we haven't physically lived where he li he lived or when he lived 2000 years ago. Yet he died for us. You may come in here this morning operating under the assumption that he does not know you. That how could someone who doesn't know me know the things that I've done, know who I've been do anything for me? But there's a man named Jesus that lived for 33 years on this earth, 2,000 years ago. And He gave everything that He could give so that you could live a life that is blessed and abundant and in favor and in blessing. Even when hard times come, even when circumstances are overwhelming, I'm still blessed. Even when things ain't going my way, I still got favor. Brother Wayne was talking on Wednesday night. He said, you know, there's people who ask me, how you doing? And he says, well, I'm blessed and highly favored. He said, they look at me like I'm just, I got three eyes. Because they really don't know what that means anymore. Right? It's not a common phrasing that you hear as much as before. Now, in church circles, maybe. But the blessing and the favor don't stop just because of our circumstances. Just because of what we're going through. Just because of our tragedies. Um, the blessing and the favor of the Lord is always good. He's always on time. His mercies are new every morning. I, I'm blessed in season and out of season. I'm blessed when I go out and I'm blessed when I come in. Those are the promises of a living God in my life. And I live that out today. And as I look around um, on this Memorial Day, Things are much different than they used to be. Now, I'm not going to go too far down that path because we all know that it leads to Wonderland. And we'll be here all day if we talk about how things aren't like they used to be. 
And I've just come to the conclusion that it's okay that things aren't like they used to be because of the fact that truth doesn't change no matter what anybody says. No matter what's trending, no matter what's going on, truth don't change. And I don't want to jump ahead of myself because I'm going to be there in just a minute. But today I want to talk to you about how to lay your life down. Because a lot of us have questions um, without answers when it comes to practically living out what it means to be a Christian. For many people, Christianity, especially where we live in the Bible Belt, in the southeast of the United States, you can talk to anybody and they'll tell you, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. I go to church. And they only go to church once a year, twice a year if you're lucky. But because they, they go do that and they get their spiritual checkup and they, they do those things, they think I'm good with God because I'm a good person. But I'm here to tell you this morning that it doesn't work like that. You see, in America and worldwide, we have a heart problem. We really do. Uh, it's not a problem with this or a problem with that. It's not a problem with our structures. It's not a problem with our government. It's not a problem with uh, everything that everybody's trying to put it on. It's a heart problem. It's a spiritual problem. Really, what we have is a love problem. Let me explain this. Love is defined very differently now than it was 30, 40 years ago. Love is defined very differently now than it was 15 years ago. The world seems like, if, you, if you, you know, didn't know any better, you would think the world is turning faster and faster as time goes on. You would think that uh, as we go along that we, we just have no hopes of stopping or slowing down because daily there's new information coming, about, coming out about all different kinds of things. Daily we're redefining structures and boundaries that have been what they are for several generations. Daily somebody is trying to redefine something or revolutionize something and the world is turning very fast and life is moving very fast. And sometimes it can be overwhelming. Love is defined completely different now than it was 30 to 40 years ago or even just a decade ago. But here's what the Bible says. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7-8. through 8, It says, Dear friends, uh, John speaking here, Let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God. And get this last part, for God is love. We try to call all different kinds of things love nowadays. But there is just one truth about love, and that is that love, uh, its source is God because its nature is God. God is love. It comes from Him, and unless you know Him and have experienced that love, you can't really love yourself or love anybody else. You have to know something to participate in. You've, you've got to have a relationship with it to know it. Right? And so if God is love, then, then I have to know who He is. The prerequisite of knowing how to love is to know that it comes from God and to experience that real love. That's, our, that's who we want to be here. That, that's our vision of what this house should be. Is that we're a people that have experienced the real love of Jesus. And anybody that comes in, we want them to experience the real love of Jesus. Not some fake or phony love. We don't want to treat you uh, in a way that is anything less than authentic. We don't want to treat you in a way that tells you that on my face I love you, but I really wonder why you're here. Right? We have a love problem in our society and in the world today, but we've got to be a different kind of people. Greater love hath no man than he to lay his down, down his life for his friends. There's something different and special about sacrificial love. Because sacrificial love leaves no doubt in its wake. I don't know if you've ever had a relationship with someone where you question when they say, I love you. Where you question when they tell you that they care for you at a certain level. There is a, a certain uh, level of doubt that continues to exist in that love sometimes. Why? Because we're looking for people to prove it. We're looking for people to show us love more than tell us they love us. That's why, that's why people show up to, to church when there's free food. Because you're showing me something. You ain't just telling me something. 
Right? Because pe people will often not hear your message until they know how much you care for them. People will often not respond to you until they know that they're speaking, what they're saying and what they're doing is for my betterment and for my good. Why? Because we are a selfish people. We were born into sin. We are fallen in nature. We have, uh, de we have uh, deteriorated from what once was. God put Adam and Eve in the garden and they were glorified and they, were, they didn't have any issues or belly buttons. <laughs> you ever heard that? <laughs> they didn't have any issues. They, they, were, they, were, they were glorified. It was how God intended for it to be. But something happened in that garden and they ate and partook of something that God said not to partake in. And because of that, they deteriorated and they put themselves in a state of continuous deterioration. And we are all looking for something that will preserve who we are. Right? We, we, we put things in place to make sure that our life lasts as long as it can. We, put, we, 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 we buy insurance, right? We, we, we insure the, the assets that we have. We, we go around and, and we, we, we have savings accounts. And we have uh, precautionary boundaries that help us to be safe when we're doing so. Keep all arms and, and hands and legs and heads and feet inside the cart at all times. My son has a really hard time with that one. But there are boundaries that are in place to keep us safe. Why? Because we have this... A subconscious natural desire to preserve the vapor of a life that we have. Well, if it is true that my life is just a vapor, if it is true that I just have this short period of time, that my life is defined by, by that dash between one year and another, if that's all I get, I want to be here as long as I can and live it fully. And there are people going, take me on, Jesus, I'm ready to go. There, there are some people who, who are saying, I, I don't want to be here anymore. But I'm here to tell you this morning that you are here because God has a purpose for you. He's not done. I've heard so many people who, are, uh, who, who have went through tragedy and crisis. And they, they at one point maybe thought that they were going to be on the other side of eternity. Uh, at some point through that crisis. But they came through it. I have heard time and time again them say, God must have had something else for me to do. Why? Because He saved me not just for sin, from sin, but for purpose. Right? And so that's His love for us. He, we, we want to preserve our lives, uh, but, but God desires for us to live in such a way that we lay down our life, this life that means so much to us. At times, uh, and, and hopefully at all times, your life does mean something to you. But uh, that this life that means so much to us, God is calling us to be willing to lay it down. Amen. Well, I, what are you talking about? He said, take up your cross and follow Him. He also said that he that loses his life shall find it. And he who clings to his life, he'll lose it. His desire is for you to have abundant life. And if that's the case, and he tells me that he who loses it will find it, he, that tells me he wants me to lose my life. The first way that I have to lose my life, and before I do anything, uh, and, and, and to understand what it means to lay my life down practically, it begins with a relationship with Jesus. It begins with this idea that I believe that He is the Lord of my life and the Savior of my life. He didn't just save me from sin, but He is the Lord of my life. I live to honor Him now. There are too many people. Let me just stop right here. And I'm setting up where I'm really going today, so just hang tight. I know some of y'all are looking at your watch like my grill is, is ready to be fired up. But hang in with me for just a second. Uh, it, our relationship with Jesus often is um, categorized by Him being a Savior. We preach that He's a Savior a lot. Why? Because we've come into a, a generation. I'm not just talking about a generation like millennials or Gen X, Y, Z, LMNOP, whatever it is. But we've come into a generation, a time in our world and in our life where we are constantly wanting to be saved by somebody. We've got people who are constantly looking for pity. People who are weak and selfish 
in their nature and, and we're looking to be saved. And you need to understand, you are totally depraved. You are in a place where you cannot come to salvation on your own. You cannot save yourself. But too many people are quick to accept the Savior Jesus and they want to push away the Lord Jesus. Because He's not just, I need you to hear me, He's not just my Savior from my sin, from hell, from burning for eternity. He's not just my Savior, but He is the Lord of my life. It is an honor to serve Him. We, we may have some people in the house today that you're going, oh yes, I'm saved. Yeah, but are you enlisted in service? It's great that you're saved and you recognize that, maybe you do recognize that Jesus is the way. And you don't fully understand everything about the Bible or everything about God. But I'm here to tell you that God didn't just Send Jesus to die on the cross so that you can have a moment in an altar and somebody pray with you. Or you pray these words that say, Lord, forgive me and I'm going to walk away. But now you actually have to walk that out. You've got to get up and you have to walk away from the place that you said those words and you have to start making it a reality. And you've got to start saying, I will not allow anything or anybody to tear me away from my positioning with God now. Because as soon as you accept Jesus, guess what? You're going right back out there. As, and it don't have to be in the church. As soon as you get up from by, beside your bed when you say your nightly prayers with your kids. Or maybe you're just saying them by yourself. When you, when you get up from beside your bed, guess what? You're going to go to sleep and you're going to wake up and you're going to go back out into a world. That's going to present you with the same problems. They're going to present you with the same people that you've been hanging around. It's going to be the same job you've been going to. Look, I'm getting serious about this stuff. I've been thinking about it. And I've just been saying, Lord, what is it that you want? I, what, do you, what is it that you want from us? And I, I just feel like that the Lord has just been saying to me, I'm looking for a generation that will rise up and be pioneer in spirit again and say, whatever it takes, wherever I have to go, whatever I have to do, I'm going to follow Jesus. And everybody else can waste away to nothing, but I'm going to follow Him. If you come in this house, you're going to hear a message that not a lot of people want to preach anymore. Why? Because it scares people away. To think that I have to give everything up that I've been doing. Maybe, maybe even the job that I've been working, and I love it. Why? Because it keeps me in some sort of normalcy of what I used to be. God didn't call you to normalcy. Matter of fact, the Bible said uh, that, that we're a peculiar people. That we're going, this is not our home. This is not the place that, that God has purposed for us. Right? We are, we are to stand out and be separate and set apart. But you cannot cling to an old lifestyle and hang on to Jesus' hand at the same time. He's going way too fast and He's pushing too powerfully for your grip to hang on while you try to drag something that's dead in your past. You can't do that. So if, I, if I've got to move on and, and go to a different place, and I don't know who this is for, but if I've got to go to a different job, I need to leave my job and go to a different job. And, and if, I, if I've got to, 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 to leave people behind, I've got to go and leave people behind and find a new group of people because I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor God's children begging bread. And if those people are not for me, I know God's for me, and I don't have to worry about who is in and out of my life. There's somebody... Who will be something to me where I'm going. Abraham left without the promise of anything except for God just saying, just go where I tell you to go. And he went and it was a place, it says it was flowing with milk and honey. It was Canaan land. It was a promised land. It was a place where Israel, the children of Israel would prosper for generations to come. All he left was, was a vague promise from God. But we have got to have a relationship with Jesus that is different that pushes us to a place where we understand life in terms of I've got to change something to be something different. Hear me. I'm going to talk to this section right here just real quick. Hear me. I've got to change something. My life has to change. I can't keep doing the things that I used to do. Saints of God, you've been serving the Lord for 30, 40 years. You can't do the same things that you did 10 years ago. Why? Because growth will lead you elsewhere. 
If you're new in Christ, you've got to be different. You've got to get out from where you are and go to where He's called you to. Where He's already said you should go. You're just lagging behind because you're afraid of what's on the other side. I might not be accepted. I might not get to do the things that I'm doing that cause me enjoyment right now. There is an enjoyment that you have not known in your life if you will let go of what it is that you've been clinging to. That's the thing that's holding you back. Hear me. That's the thing that's holding you back. You've got to let go. There is a relationship with Jesus that you have to have. And it's got to be more than just this save me, save me, save me stuff all the time. It's got to be more than that. Because God hadn't called you to that. That is a, that is a tool and a tactic of Satan in your life. You don't think Satan works on Christians? They're the only ones he works on. If you're a sinner, he ain't fooling with you. He's already got you. He, he's not messing with you. He's, already, he, he's, not, he's not concerned about you until you start living for Jesus. When you start to speak purpose and line your life up with God, then the devil starts to get nervous and shaky. When you start to line your life up with purpose and what God says, I don't know how he does it. So don't come up to me after service going, well, you said to do this, so how do I do it? I don't know what it looks like for you. You've got to get out of the Savior mentality because uh, if you're looking to other people to give you the answer, Jesus is not your Savior anymore. It's the person you're looking to for an answer. He's not just a Savior. He's your Lord. You are called to honor Him with your life. To lay your life down if need be for His story to be told. For the gospel to go forward. It is not lost on me that ten years from now I might find myself in a prison cell because of laws that have been changed. It is not lost on me that I might be a modern day Paul or Silas. And I'm telling you, I've just made up my mind. I'm just going to praise Him and I'm just going to worship Him. And I've already made the decision. Because whether I find myself in a jail cell because of the gospel or somebody walks in through those doors and shoots me up, I'm going to die knowing that I gave everything for Him. I, I will do whatever it takes to see Jesus come and the kingdom expand. We've got to have that mindset. And I'm not, by no means am I perfect. By no means am I saying, you, you should just be like me. Lord, no. I'm chief of sinners. That's what Paul said. And it goes for me. I, I need Jesus more and more every day. Every day. But we've got to have a relationship with Jesus. And in John chapter 14 and 6, for us to have a relationship with Jesus, see this. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Amen. What is that relationship going to look like? It can't be rituals. Your relationship with God can't be about coming into church, hearing a good message, feeling inspired, wearing all the right clothes, looking the part, saying the right things, giving the Sunday school answer, and walking back out and being who you've always been. It can be rituals. Rituals will not save you. You will spend your whole life sitting in a church chair or pew, and you'll get to heaven, and you'll say, but Lord, didn't I go to church? Didn't I prophesy in your name? There's some people that's going to say, Lord, I was baptized with the Holy Ghost. And he said, yeah, but you wasn't saved. Because we've equated the baptism of the Holy Ghost with speaking in tongues and not having a clean heart subsequent to the salvation movement in our life. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is a clean heart. It's not speaking in tongues. It's a clean heart. Speaking in tongues is just a sign. Let me get us back in alignment this morning. It's a clean heart. I believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with speaking of the other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. I believe that. I grew up on it. Okay? From the time that I came home and, and could go anywhere, I was in a church of God and I believed that. But I'm going to tell you, if I'm speaking in tongues and my heart's dirty, I'm going to get to heaven and not be able to enter in because baptism of the Holy Spirit is by fire and it should cleanse who you were into who God's made you to be. I can't be that person anymore. <clears throat> it can't be rituals and it cannot be lackadaisical though. I can't buy into this, well, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Well, no, you don't. Nobody said you had to. But it's an instruction that you should assemble yourself. I'm not trying to be angry this morning. 
But I'm trying to correct something for this house. We got, we've got to be tied to the bride of Christ. It can't be like a day of call. I can't just live my life however and not be uh, conscientious of the Spirit of God in my life and then lay my head down at night and go, oh, I didn't pray today. Thank you, Jesus, for today. Amen. It don't work like that. He wants a purposeful, intent relationship with you. And it's locked with, this, with His church. He said three things. Three things really quick, and I'm going to be done, okay? Can you hang in there? Three things really quick. Practically, this is what life, laying your life down looks like to have a relationship with Jesus and to move forward. You ready? Here we go. Number one, the way. He said, I'm the way. He's the way. Jesus is the way we should live our lives. He was a friend to all people, so I need to be a friend to all people. He lived above the words of hurtful people. He lived above those words. He did not operate in bitterness toward people that opposed Him. He did not have unforgiveness toward people that hurt Him. He did not be mean and nasty to people. Now, He told them the truth, but He wasn't mean and nasty to them. Luke 23 and 34, as a matter of fact, on the cross, during the time where the people were being the ugliest and nastiest to Him, He said from His own mouth, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. He had compassion and love for them as He died on a rugged cross, bloody and beaten, that they had done to Him. And He said, forgive them, God, because they don't know what they're doing. He brought a love, a kindness, and a compassion to the people that He was around that they had never known. Over 20 times in the Bible, it says that people were amazed or astonished by Jesus. They were amazed and astonished. And the, 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 the question that I'm wondering is, is the way that you're living your life amazing and astonishing people today? Is the way that you're living something different? Is it so different that people look at your life and they go, there is just something. I can't put my finger on it. But there's just something about them that I just feel drawn to them. I just like them. They're just good people. You ever heard somebody say that? They're good people. Right? It, it, it's reserved for those Like you just can't put your finger on it. But there's just an anointing there that, that's, that you can't uh, define. But you know that there's something different about them. And my question to you is the way that you're living, the way of Jesus, is it astonishing and amazing to people how you can love them and keep on trucking through tragedy and never quit because of depression or anxiety or fear? Now I'm not speaking out against those things. What I'm telling you is... That that you don't stop. You keep having faith in Jesus. There's something different about the way that you live. He said, I am the way. Secondly, he said, I'm the truth. He's the truth. Jesus models the way, but he lives it in light of the truth that he speaks. He didn't bend or break because of pressures. He didn't bend or break because of trends. He didn't bend or break because... This certain group of people would accept me if I would just lay off the message that I'm preaching just a little bit. I, I, I've been preaching a little too hard, maybe. Maybe I've been talking about hell too much. Maybe I've been talking about money too much. Maybe this, that, or the other. He didn't give in to pressures. He just went and he spoke the truth as it is, and he didn't apologize for it. I, I, am, just, I am just tired of apologizing for the truth. I'm, I'm tired of apologizing to people for the truth. Why? Because every time I apologize to them for the truth, I tell them, this is the truth, but it's okay for you to keep doing what you're doing. I'm just not going to apologize for it anymore. This is the truth, and, and I'm going to speak it in love. I want to speak it in love. We should speak it in love, but we have to be a people that are going to live in the light of the truth. Most of us don't tell the truth because the truth convicts us in places that we haven't given up yet. Most of us hold back from telling the full truth because God has convicted us of something that we're dealing with and we haven't overcome it yet or we've not given it up conscientiously yet and so we don't want to tell it. But what if we were people that said, God, I surrender. I give it to you. You're not just my Savior, but you're my Lord. And so, God, if you're dealing with me about something, I'm going to give it up. Because when it comes time to tell the truth, I want to be able to have a testimony that bears witness to what I'm saying. 
He's not after you to be perfect. He's after you to be in pursuit. He wants you to constantly be walking after Him. Becoming more and more like Him day after day. Sanctification, baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's cleaning that heart out. It's purifying us so that one day when we get to heaven, we can say, I gave all that I had, God, for you. And He'll be pleased in the sight of Jesus. Not in us, because even though we may be walking in that, our righteousness is but filthy rags. We still have to have Jesus. So no matter where you are or what you're doing, there is a truth that you have got to deal with. There's a truth that we all need to proclaim. In John 6, 60, it says that many of His disciples said, this is very hard to understand. Talking about the, the teaching about the kingdom of God. He said, how can, they said, how can anyone accept it? And the Bible says that there were many of His disciples that left Him at that time. Because they could not deal with the truth that He was preaching. Truth is the truth and there is no changing it. We have to live by our truth. And our truth is this, that God created man and woman, male and female. There is an eternal heaven and there is an eternal hell. There is a triune Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. If you don't live your life by what's taught in the Bible, this is my truth. You are separating yourself in error and sin from God. That's the truth. The truth is that Jesus paid the price so that we can go to heaven. It's not what you wear that gets you to heaven. It's not your last name that gets you to heaven. It's not how long you've attended church that gets you to heaven. It's not rituals or works that gets you to heaven. It is only by the faith that you have in the saving grace of Jesus Christ. The one way and the one truth. Only Jesus and His grace can save you. You can begin to play for me. We believe that one, marriage is between one man and one woman. We believe that He desires for you to be sober without need for anything, for validation or satisfaction. I can't cover all the bases, but this is our truth. Our truth cannot change. Our truth may, must never bend or break with the trends and the tides of society. We've got to go with it. The truth cannot change. He spoke this truth in love to everybody He met. He met a woman who was about to be stoned to death that in their day their law said she's got to be stoned for what she's done. She's an adulteress and we can't have this. And he walked up to her and he said, where are your accusers after teaching them a lesson? And she said, they've gone. And what did he say to her? He said, your sins are forgiven. Now get up and go and sin no more. God will save you out of it. But He expects you not to walk back to it once He does. God will deliver you, but He expects you not to go back to it once you've come out of it. I know the temptation is strong. I know it's there. I know that it's pulling on you. Some of you might be under the sound of my voice this morning. You hadn't dealt with that temptation in years, but all of a sudden, it's raising its old ugly head again, and it's looking right at you going, come on. You just need, it's not a big deal. You just need a little something to get you by. You just need one moment of this to get you by. You, you, you just need to participate in that desire one more time to, just to get you by and then you'll be good. I'm here to tell you that it'll raise its head again and again and again and it, and, and, and it will offer itself to you over and over. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. You have spiritual life today available to you because He is the way. He is the truth. He's provided a way. He is the life. Is the life that you're living, does it measure up to God's desire for you? This is not a prosperity gospel. This is not telling you that everything's going to be fine and that if you just believe for it, it's just going to come to you and it's going to naturally just, all your problems are just going to melt away and I'm going to have everything I want, every, everything I, I just desire all the time. No, that's not the case. Why? Because God has plans for you and He must grow you into those plans. There is a purpose for your life. I'm going to preach it until I die. God has a purpose for your life. Where you currently are is not all there is. Don't believe the lie that God can't use you. Don't believe the lie that you have messed up too much. 
that if don't believe the lie that if people found out just who you are or what you've done that they would never listen to you again i'm telling you god took a prostitute and he he used the, that that woman to to bring israel into the promised land god god took that same woman and out of her lineage came the son of the living god there were adulterers in the lineage of Jesus. There were people who were thieves. There were people who were liars. But God took each and every one of their mistakes and He turned them around for glory. Whatever you have done, whoever you have been, wherever you're walking this morning, there is a life for you in Jesus. I just don't know if I can get out of this. I don't know if I can get out of this life. I don't know if I can give this up. I don't know if I can walk away. Yes, you can. How do you know that, Pastor? Because if you'll give it to Jesus, He'll never leave you nor forsake you. I speak, that, that's like, I know it seems hard to grasp because it's such a spiritual thing. It's not a physical thing. It's not like you're going to walk out of here and somebody walk up to you and say, Hey, I've got a job for you. Want it? Hey, I've got this for you. Do you want it? Your family or friend, a family member or friend is not going to just meet you at the doorway and say, hey, I forgive you for what happened. I'm not bitter towards you anymore for what happened. It's not going to happen like that. But what I do know is that when you give your life over to Jesus, I don't know the timeline and I don't know how it's going to, how it's going to look. But what I do know is that His plans are for, are for you to prosper and have a hope and have a future. They're not here to harm you and bring no good to you. Can you give it over to Jesus? Can you walk in that? Can you, can you really lay your life down? Are you going to designate your life in Jesus to being about the church that you go to? To being about getting fixed one time a week? Going out and being broken for six days until you can come back in and be fixed all over again? Can you today make a decision to say, you know what? He's already saved me. I'm not going, I don't have to put up with the junk of the devil anymore. I don't have to live that life anymore. I don't have to be who I've been. I don't have to be broken anymore. I don't have to have a low self-image anymore. I don't need to stare in the mirror and hate myself anymore. I don't need to be in that abusive relationship anymore. I don't need the attention of every boy on, the, on, the, on every corner. I don't need the attention of every girl on every corner. I don't have to be built up by anybody except for Him. I don't have to be bitter anymore. I don't have to have unforgiveness anymore. I can walk and say I forgive you and love that person again. Are you going to make a decision today that will say, I want that kind of life? Because when the time comes, Somebody else is dealing with it. I don't want to have to say, I know, I just don't know what to do. Will you be able to say, I can give you the answer. I can show you the way. Will you lay your life down today? Because let's be honest, this morning you didn't come here to hear, how can I help that person that I can't stand? You didn't come here to hear the message about, I gotta give up the things that I enjoy doing. You didn't come here to hear a message about the stuff that, that I'm supposed to do so other people can live an abundant life. But I'm telling you, when you lay your life down, truly, those are byproducts of a life that has been surrendered to Jesus. When your when your issues are touched by Jesus, when your issues are solved by your sovereign king when, when, when your issues are when you've been delivered out of the things and the problems and the people that keep tormenting your life when you're delivered other people will get delivered because of you there will be people that you never even come into contact with but you will change their life without even knowing it and you will get your life lined up with him and lay it down and say God it's yours whatever you want you can have it Every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, right where you are sitting. He's the way, He's the truth, and He's the life. If you pastor, I don't have a relationship with Jesus, or my relationship with Jesus has been severely broken by things that I have continued to participate in 
or things that I have yet to give up. And I want a relationship that actually means something to the Lord. I want a relationship that will change the, the very way that I live my life and bring abundance and favor and blessing into my life from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. If that's the relationship that you need and you want today, would you slip your hand up? Nobody's looking around. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Thank you. There's a couple hands going up. Anybody else? This is your opportunity. Nobody's looking around for you to say, I need that kind of relationship that will change something in my life. I don't want it to be the same. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Every head bowed and every eye closed. This is a very serious moment because I need you to do something. You may have lifted your hand before and not come to the altar. I'm asking everybody to keep their eyes closed to, to, to secure your decision in this moment. I need you to, 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 to step out, to get up and step out and come to this altar. I want, I want to pray with you this morning before we even move on. I want to pray with you. Nobody's looking around. If you lifted your hand, I want you to come. Nobody's looking around. Heads bowed and eyes are closed. Heads bowed and eyes are closed. If you lifted your hand this morning for salvation, to begin a relationship that will change your life with Jesus, I want you to come and find a place in this altar. This is too important. I want to give my heart to Jesus. Nobody's looking around. Nobody's looking around. I want you just to begin to pray and give it to God. Okay, I'm going to come pray with you in just a moment. This morning, if you'd say, I have let my truth bend. I have dealt with something in my life that I, 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 have, I have not told the truth on. I have not stuck to my guns. I have given in to the ways of the world. I need to be sanctified this morning. There's something in me that's got to change. I need purif a purifying moment with Jesus today. Would you just lift your hand? There's something in my life that I have given up on. And I'm just, I, I have not pleased Jesus with my life. Whether it be this week, last week, last year, whatever it is. If you'd say, Pastor, I'm holding on to bitterness. I'm holding on to unforgiveness. I'm holding on to a grudge. Something that's holding me back. Would you just lift your hands up? Nobody's looking around. Head bowed and eyes closed. If you'd say, Pastor, today I know that God has a life for me that's different than what I'm living. God has a purpose for me. God has called me. He's called me into ministry maybe. Hear me now, sons and daughters, young people. He's called me into ministry. I'm calling you out. He's called me into ministry. He's called me into purpose. He's got something for me to do in my life. If you say that's me, would you just throw your hand up? He's got a calling on my life. Come on, lift your hand strong. I don't want you to do this little weak thing. Come on, God's got a purpose on my life. Thank you. Is there anybody else? He's got a calling. Maybe it's not ministry. Maybe it's something else He's revealed to me. Maybe you don't know what it is, but you say, God, I want to know what it is that you have for me. Would you just lift your hand? I'm ready to take that step. I want to know what it is in this season. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Now, if you lifted your hand for either of those things, I want you to come and find a place in this altar. Nobody looking around. If you lifted your hand, I want you to come and find a place in this altar. I want you to begin to pray for those that have come. Prayer intercessors, if you're a part of the prayer team, if you're an intercessor, I want you to make your way up here. I did that so there's anonymity. I want there to be anonymity for people. We don't need to know why you're here. But the important thing is that you come. I want you to begin to pray with those who have come.